submitted during the 20-day period as sort of a prophylactic in case somebody did ask for a trial de novo, there would be a, a doc, the trial judge's docket would be prepared for that event? I, I don't understand. Well, I think the way your opponent explains it in briefing is that at the time Judge Allen requested the order and it was submitted, you were the the time period was within the 20 days of the arbitrator's decision for the demand of a trial de novo. And the explanation that I understand your opponent has provided is that in order to maintain essentially a, a placeholder on the docket in case a trial, what in case your client moved for a trial de novo, that the case would be kept in line without having to fall out of place for purposes of a trial setting. Maybe I haven't articulated that well enough, but that's what I think that's what your opponent's position of reading is. Let me answer both questions. Okay. Uh, uh, first, question is with regard to your question. Uh, nothing says that asking for a trial has to be the only sole single purpose of sending for it. Yes, we, we, we hear tell that the uh, judge account required the uh, ask for the it says trial they missed. Uh, but that doesn't need to be the only reason why. But it's clearly, but if you read the letter, it's clearly in response to the pretrial that happened as opposed to the arbitration. I mean, the letter I, I, well, I, to the pretrial that had just occurred. I, I agree with the first part of your statement. I respectfully disagree that it is as opposed to, I don't think it, it eliminates that possibility. It does not, it says nothing about it. If it had said that, Judge, it would be a great idea. What incentive did your opponent not have the problem? What, in having the what incentive did your opponent have? Okay, why would your as a practical matter, why would your opponent have wanted a trial de novo? The arbitrator awarded everything your that your opponent was seeking. You, you know what I thought of that? I thought of that. Why would he why would he think that? Okay. Uh, and the answer is all of us here today. 
Are in our part, we're doing what we do because people do irrational things, because people do things that are difficult to understand. And I don't think it needs to go a whole lot deeper than that. The record does contain some evidence, and particularly the briefings contain evidence of a certain level of political animus between parties. American right really doesn't like some so well, that's the nature of a lot of litigation. But the statute here does provide sort of guard, you know, guardrails for us. And what it says is that an arbitration decision shall be final if a request for trial de novo is not filed within the prescribed time. And I'm struggling on this record to find a request for a trial de novo. Well, the request for the trial de novo comes in a letter. And the proposal nowhere, the re- nowhere anywhere in the record does anyone ever use the term I want a trial de novo. That is not in this record. No, sir. No, sir, but there is the, the authorities in the Greeks do state that uh, it doesn't need to have a thing. I think it's a Taylor case. Uh, it doesn't need to say it's a motion for trial. The, the question is the general does it need inquiry. to say it's a motion? I mean, mm-hmm. and there is a distinguished like the rule says motion, the statute says request, but there, I, I don't see how this letter following up from a pretrial giving the court an amended order is a request for a trial de novo. Well, as, I, as I said, if you were in front of the line saying the letter is to get the trial. But wouldn't you expect the letter to say, I am hereby requesting a trial de novo? No. no words to that effect? Not necessarily because I don't know really that. Otherwise, we're just swinging at goats. We don't really know what the intent was, right? Well, I, I, I don't know. If, no, we don't know, of course, what was in Mr. Lulai's mind. Uh, we don't know what was in Ameripride's mind. We don't know what was in the judge's mind or what she actually said. We don't know any of that. Because we don't have a record and we don't have a transcript of that hearing. Then, you, then we are left with the, what we do have, which is a record of the letter and the proposed order. And that has some significance to it. This is a proposed order, I think. The burden here judge. is on the appellant. The burden it here is on appeal is on your clients. And that's, that is absolutely so correct. And, I, and, and I've cited a number of cases that say that, but we're not appealing events that occurred at that hearing. We're appealing events that occurred substantially later. For which there is no record because there was no hearing. The judge uh, entered the order without a hearing. The order denying the uh, motion to vacate. That was entered by the judge without a hearing. So there is no hearing. There is no record. She entered simply on the basis of the motion and the support of affidavits of plaintiffs. And, and so I, I, I respectfully do submit that uh, that letter did seek a trial because. They sent it. That's what it did. That was the intended effect. That was the only effect of the letter is to set a trial date. It had no other, no other intended effect. And you intend the logical and natural consequences of your act. We see this in tort law all the time. But basically, everybody intends the natural and moral consequences of what you do. If you like, send that letter, you probably intend to get a trial date. And I, I, I think, given the fact that a request can be almost almost anything where you see something um, that that letter and including the enclosed proposed for suffices to be a request. Switching now to the question of estoppel. Switching now to that question. Was that argument, was the estoppel argument made in the trial court? I mean, pardon? Did you make the, did your client make the estoppel argument in the trial court? Yes, ma'am. Where? We did. I, I, I can get it for you. I mean, it's right here. I have the, the motion. Um, and it appears in uh, the locations where I talk about. Um, uh, there, well, first, we're going to the receipt of the documents from the motion and the letter and such. Uh, and then on page nine of the motion, they received a copy of this revised letter of August 24 and the proposed amendment order, setting pretrial and non trial reason and led defendants to believe that there was no further action required to preserve their right to trial. Um, and then, uh, and whether B, it states, uh, Mr. Rubai's letter, um, no, this is a letter, proposed order again, would have misled defendants into believing there was no need for an action. I have no need for an action. Isn't that an argument, basically, that, I mean, they're, they're ignorant of the law? I mean, just because they're pro se doesn't mean they get the benefit of saying, well, I don't know what the law is. I didn't say that. 
Well, I just say that in motion. Well, I, I agree. We are all bound to know the law. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. We all know that we all so. So, what people. in that letter would have given them the a misrepresentation, misled them down the path that counsel had requested a trial de novo, or didn't do that? Well, Your Honor, I, I again, um, I, I don't want to repeat myself on that. I, I will say this: people are bound to know the law. They're not bound to know the internal procedures and processes within a court or within a courthouse. They're not bound to know that we should know what the lawyers actually draft the orders. The public isn't bound to know that. If you go out and ask anybody up and down and you show an order signed by a judge, what are they going to think? It's I, unlikely I, they're going to think. Let me put it this way the statute says you have to request a trial de novo. So if your clients had wanted a trial de novo, they would have been bound by the statute to have requested a trial de novo. No, ma'am, that's not true. The uh, statute provides that any party may request a trial. I, and I, having I, taken, having seen that Ameripi did so. No, my, I guess my it. point is, is if your clients had wanted to, they would have been bound by the statute to have requested, in fact, a trial de novo. It, it, there's nothing in the statute that says the losing party in the arbitration has to make the motion or has to make the request. It can be made by anyone. And in this case, it was made by America. And if we want, if we move on to the, the estoppel issue, um, I, I don't have time. Okay. Did you want rebuttal time? I forgot to ask you. I'm sorry. Did you want to reserve rebuttal time? I would like uh, four minutes. Okay. I'll close time. You got about four minutes until you hit your four minutes. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so if we move on to the uh, estoppel argument, which I do believe was raised sufficiently, and I've provided the authorities to support that. Um, I, I, if you don't move on the estoppel argument, then the, the situation is that he received, my wife received the order, and he says, okay, fine, he's sending a letter to start a trial, and then they see uh, the reason the new they, they look at the amendment of the order and try to the trial, and then they get the order. So, Within 14 days of the receipt of the arbitrator's decision, my clients see that uh, Mayor Pride, uh, Mr. Truman, has sent a letter to the judge asking, including a proposed order, a proposal for a trial date. That's what that order says. It is a proposed order. And, yet, and they also say that the letter says, anything else I can do for you, judge, let me know. First, to that effect. And then a week later, they get a signed copy of the order actually setting the trial. At that point, they have a reasonable belief that there's no need for them to ask for a trial because, again, any party under both the order and the motion can set, uh, can ask for a trial. It doesn't need to be the party who lost either, who lost the uh, arbitration. It doesn't need to be the plaintiff or the defendant, whatever. Uh, it can be any party, including third parties in, in the, uh, in, in when the, the when the pretrial order issued on September, uh, when the pretrial order issued on September 1st, did your client move for clarification or to strike the order or otherwise attack the uh, motion? Only my motion to vacate. And when was that filed? When was your motion to vacate filed? The 29th of September. Which was after the arbitration, after the order declaring the arbitration award final that was issued a week after the pretrial order? It was before the final judgment. So, it's over here, of course, and both of them. If you look, if you look at the mindset of my client, like I said, that in there I made an idea that the lawyers actually draw up uh, orders. But in this case, they said, that, yeah, wow, a lawyer did draw up this order because it says something like that. Here's the one, here's the judge, judging from lawyer to judge, here's the order. So now we've got a lawyer drawing uh, an order from those sort of those judge. In the minds of the layman, and we put that cover letter. But then the confirming thing here on the estoppel is that what do you know? As of September 1, a trial date is set, and it's set within 14 days of that arbitration decision. And at that point, why would my clients feel? Like we need a second demand for a trial. We need a second order to say a trial. The second order is going to say what? Well, it's going to say the same thing this one says. And maybe this time it broke into, I don't know. But I, I don't see how you would have a need for two motions for trial in, in the mind of a, of a lay person. 
in the minds of the layperson. And bear in mind, I'm not talking about not knowing the law, we're talking about not really knowing the procedures and processes in a courtroom. And, and so, why would you think that there is a necessity for him to do it twice? And yet, another court, I, I, I suggest that this top argument is, um, is I, I believe, to be a stronger or two arguments. I will tell you that. But I also believe that, Larry, given the, the, the Given the scope of what can be a request, that that letter and the order um, suffice to be a request. Any other questions? Did I say about four minutes? You still have your four minutes left. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, court. Uh, my name is Jody Rubai, and I represent Merrill Pride. I represent them in the proceeding below before Judge Allen. As well as on this appeal, I wasn't their first attorney. The Tillabooz had a prior attorney, and he withdrew because they did not comply with the discovery or discovery order letter, etc. Mr. Tillabooz flat out refused to participate with any attorney whatsoever. Um, whatever orders were submitted as far as pretrial and trial were directed by Judge Allen and produced on the form she tells us to fill in to put the dates on them. After this case was sent to arbitration the first time, it was actually sent one time to arbitration to be done. From the point of the arbitration forward, nobody made a demand for a motion for new trial or anything like that. What had happened was Mr. Ferguson had the arbitration on August 14th. On that Monday, he concluded and wrote the opinion, which I, I find this ironic that I'm the employee in a situation where I'm supposed to, my client's got to write a big check to his client at the end because we're asking to enforce the contract to buy. Anyways, the judge, the arbitration decision is rendered on Monday at 10 30 a.m. They are emailed to both of us. In big bold letters, it, it advises at the bottom so that even if you didn't know the statute, didn't know the rules, and even though you just have to know that, you got 20 days to demand a trial. If you don't like this arbitration, it's going to become binding. It's in big bold letters. Mr. Bill Silver swears in his affidavit, he read the whole thing. The next day after that's there, our pretrial conference is scheduled because this thing has been put off so long that Mr. Silver said, I'm not paying any arbitrator in advance. I'm not paying anybody a nickel. He clearly knew enough English to understand not to pay money on this event on this property that we're investment property we're talking about. So we're at the hearing for the pretrial conference at 2:30 a.m. The arbitration awards are sealed so that the judge doesn't know what the ruling of the arbitrator is. She doesn't know what Chris Ferguson wrote or didn't write or what the ruling was. Only we know, and Mr. Sillaboo knows. She says, you know, basically that he says there's no record of the pre-trial conference. Look, you guys, this I can't know what this is about, but you got to have more time to decide what to do with this thing. Mr. Rubai, I'm rescheduling this trial too. Here's the dates. I want you to make up an order. I want you to send it in to put it out. I give you guys plenty of time to deal with this matter. I write up the letter, send the order. I didn't make up those dates and times. There never was a motion for me, even for another trial. I wasn't saying anything. She told us, and Mr. Yeah, Schultz, but that's not in the record, counsel. It's not in the record, but counsel implying that what he did was that he wrote his facts up in the initial brief. He left off the 18th hearing. When he made the motion before Judge Allen, he left off the 18th hearing. That 18th hearing at 2.30 p.m. is pivotal because Mr. Silva never says that the judge didn't order these dates rescheduled to a later date because of the arbitration being pending. He never did discuss this in his affidavit at all. And in his motion, in his brief, it makes it look like I just out of the blue ass for new trial dates. And that's not at all what happened. And there is absolutely nothing I mean, talk about no good deal of punishment. I'm told by the judge to do something. I do it, just send copies. And now suddenly another lawyer, 42 days after this arbitration award is, is written, he's writing, and I've known Mr. Mark for a long time, a good personal relationship, but he's writing, I made this request. I, I admit it's a very clever argument. It's also totally ridiculous because rescheduling, if we're going to set aside non binding arbitration awards in the 20 day window, the only cases I know where that's been done is where the party, who is really asking for the trial has aggressively filed, you know, notice for trial and participate in discovery. There was been a bunch of stuff that went on, but they didn't technically have that motion that they filed. But still, the person who wanted that trial was within the 20-day period 
you know, and even those are highly debated issues because a lot of judges don't agree with that because as, you're not, as Ms. Judge Smith pointed out, that statute is awfully clear. It's a ministerial duty and you have to enter it. But you can't have cases where the person who's seeking the relief, Mr. Sullivan, has done stuff himself to show, look, I don't want this arbitration award. Not clear at all what he wants to do because he's about to receive a big fat check if he lets an arbitration award go through. Okay, so the thing of it is that the program says that 21 days has passed, and of course the judge removes the future date that was rescheduled to October 14th from you know September 18th, um, you know, uh, excuse me, August 18th, excuse me, because because of because of the uh, arbitration award was August 17th on Monday. The pretrial conference that had been scheduled was the next day. The judge put it out way out so there was plenty of time for everything to take place, whatever was going to take place, whether they're going to accept it, not accept it, reject it, move forward with discovery, whatever you're going to do, put it off to that date and reschedule it. First of all, it's absurd to say someone filed a motion for a new trial or a motion for trial to know. It never happened. It never happened from Ameripride. It never happened from Chilibu. And it never even happened from his client, even though the judge canceled the, canceled the uh, pre-trial and trial. They waited until 1029, and the arbitration award had become final on 97, uh, 96 and 97 was a Monday. So the next day it would have been, you know, <coughs> over because the 20 days were run. That's 98. So they're like 21 days out that they filed this motion. They don't file the affidavits to 105. In their own affidavit, they admit that they read the arbitration order. And he says, just generally, well, I thought it was not inviting, so I didn't worry about it. I didn't care about it. It said right on it that what it was. I just don't know of any case that allows a the non binding arbitration statute to be set aside where the person who's asking for it to be set aside has done absolutely nothing, nothing at all to indicate they're unhappy with the arbitration board. I mean, nothing. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. And then comes along and says that a letter order that reschedules a pretrial and trial somehow gives the person as though the arbitration order doesn't exist anymore. If that's true, the judges can never manage their dockets because the way these things go down is always the same. You set a pretrial, you set arbitration out, it gets done. If it doesn't get done in time, you, re you reschedule the pretrial and trial to a later date. And now what counsel's saying is I go back and I'm going to have to try quarterback and say, whatever letter you mail to the judge, that was a request for a trial of the NOVO, and you rejected the arbitration award. Therefore, my client didn't want the arbitration award. I, I think it's clever, but baseless. And there's no case law support it. And the argument of equitable estoppel, what is that? Equitable estoppel is when you tell somebody something. Like I told Mr. Sillabu, don't worry. You don't have to reject the arbitration award. We're going to trial. Where is that in his affidavits? No place. And then there wasn't his oral argument before the judge. Judge Allen was very patient and judicial about this entire matter. She was very delicate. She gave people plenty of wide berths to do whatever they were going to do. And nobody could sit there and complain that they didn't get a fair day in court for her because just, they, they just flat out did. I mean, believe me, cases were set up way further and put up a lot more stuff that I would. You know, would have thought would have happened with Mr. Silver for a year and a half not having a lawyer. But like I said, from one thing after the other, no discovery, doesn't comply with his first attorney, gets the first arbitrator pissed off. Excuse my language, I'm sorry. Uh, very mad because he tells him not going to pay him any money. I don't want him any money out of pocket. But he shows up to Chris Ferguson's arbitration, no objection whatsoever. The award is entered, no objection whatsoever. And nothing is said until a month later when counsel files this motion leaving out what happened on the 18th and now saying, I asked for a trial to Novo with the cover letter to the judge putting in a new date and time that she ordered I put in. Uh, I don't really have a list. If anybody has more questions, I'm prepared to answer. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your response. Uh, I do not agree, and uh, Mr. Uh, Google I had not repeated the same error he made in the briefing. Uh, there was no need to tell Mr. Salibu that he had to do the motion. The words are any party may. 
And that's the law. Any party may file that motion. It's not the burden is not just on him to do it. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry I continue to, to say bad things about my clients. I don't think that's germane to the case. Um, as far as the motion being timely as prior to final judgment, before final judgment, the court may change jurisdiction over any interlocutory order or anything that happened during the case. Um, my clients did nothing. That's the very nature of a stop. The stop was there's lots of case law that we look at uh, where, where people are stopped from denying um, uh, that uh, from you know from asserting uh, that statute of limitations as well. And uh, that's where it very commonly comes up that people lead somebody on to believe that they're going to make a deal they don't. Um, the, uh, I find it interesting that the hearing on the 18th is pivotal. Where is the transcript for me? If it's so pivotal, the burden of, of having a transcript to assert your position before the public court falls on both parties. It the burden to demonstrate reversible error falls on you. I beg your pardon? The burden to demonstrate reversible error here falls on you. And the lack of a transcript that you're relying on is a, a critical flaw in your argument to the extent you're trying to tell us what happened at that hearing. We don't have it. Applegate, we're done. I don't find no, what I don't find anything that happened in that hearing particularly good for one thing I'm not relying on what may or may not have happened. Um, and, and Your Honor, there is a case I saw in my brief that does apply that rule to the party relying on the hearing in the in, in the uh, in, if that's part of your case, it's 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 uh, But I'm not relying on what happened in that hearing. I don't know what happened in that hearing. And I'm I'm so going to concede to the truth of the So um, in any event, um, thank you for the question. Is there either further any further questions, comments? Further? No. Thank you for your time.